Jesus. What a powerful name the name of Jesus is. What a glorious name is the name of Jesus. As a matter of fact, uh, there's healing in his name. There's uh, deliverance in the name of Jesus. There is salvation in the name of Jesus. And it's at the name of Jesus that every knee must bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord. So beloved, it is a blessing to call upon the name of Jesus and sing about his name. If you have your Bibles here today, I would ask that you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to lift up this Lord's Day, verses 14 to 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. And could everyone signal that they have those verses by just simply saying, Amen. 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 I'll, begin, I'll begin reading, and I'm going to be reading from the NASB, and this is what the Word of God says. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body, being fitted together, fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and the tag we're going to add on this text is what we have been working through for this entire month and that is uh, bodybuilding. Bodybuilding, and this is part four, bodybuilding part four. And when we think about the, the ministry of the local church, beloved, I believe that we need to have an aim, a goal in mind when we think about the ministry of the local church. And the goal and aim for the ministry of the local church is spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. Maturity. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, it was the Apostle Paul who lays down this goal and aim for the local ministry or the ministry of the local church by writing, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete. In Christ. And when Paul speaks of presenting every man complete in Christ, he's speaking of presenting every man, every person mature in Christ. And although we have not arrived at maturity yet, one day every believer is going to be mature in the Lord Jesus Christ. For it has not yet appeared what we shall be. Hmm. Yet, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. Okay. And beloved, since God's goal for our lives is spiritual maturity, it can be said that uh, our goal for our lives as well ought to be spiritual maturity. Come on. And understand, when it comes to the whole, um, whole topic of spiritual maturity, God doesn't measure success how we measure success. God doesn't measure the success of a local congregation, a local assembly, by how many people are sitting in the pews each Sunday? Well, Do you understand that? Well. He doesn't measure success by how many people are sitting in a pew 
in a local church every Sunday. God measures the success of any local assembly by how many people are growing into maturity in Christ. Come on, man. Because how many of us know today that you have a lot of people mm -hmm. and at the same time you can have a lot of immature people and so, beloved, God wants us to be growing from spiritual immaturity to spiritual maturity. And if we're going to be spiritually mature, it should carry over. It should flow into the overall function of the life of the local church. Yeah. And so the writer of Hebrews, he says it, he says it best when he says in Hebrews 5 and 12, by this time you ought to be teachers. Mm. He talks about being teachers. In other words, what I believe this writer is getting at is one of the greatest signs of spiritual maturity or spiritual immaturity rather in a local assembly is the lack of teaching others. Well, the lack of teaching others. Conversely, one of the greatest signs of spiritual maturity in a local assembly is the presence of mature believers who are teaching other believers. And God, beloved, has never intended for us to always just simply come to church and be taught without teaching somebody else. Amen. Mm. Amen. <laughs> what are we doing with uh, what we are learning? Mm. It's not for us to hide under a bushel mm. so that nobody can see it. What we are learning, we ought to share with those who are in our proximity. And so teaching is not something that is necessarily relegated for those who are in pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. Every mature believer has a teaching responsibility. Every mature believer should be doing some teaching. Older men teaching younger men the word of God. Older women teaching younger women the word of God. Husbands teaching their wives the word of God. Parents teaching their children the word of God. Grandparents even teaching their grandparents the word of God. And the reason being is when there is much teaching well, in a local assembly, there will be much growth. And not numerical growth, but the growth that you see from people's lives being transformed. Come on. That's the kind of growth that people ought to want to see. An assembly where the saints are being equipped to do the work of ministry. As the word of God says in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. That, that God has given. He's given pastor teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Amen. So if the saints are not doing the work of ministry and it's just left up to a solo pastor teacher to do the work of ministry, the work of ministry is going to fall short in a lot of areas. Amen. And so it takes all kinds of people who have been redeemed by God using the gifts that they have been given to do the work of ministry. It's, let me explain to you this way. It's kind of like being on a football team. And on a football team, players go to the classroom to learn the plays. Mm -hmm. And the reason they go to the classroom to learn the plays is so they can be equipped when they get on the field. Mm -hmm. 
And beloved, the classroom is not the field. I mean, there's a lot of players who may look good and sound good in the classroom, but you really don't know how them players are going to perform until you see them on the field. Come on. And likewise, beloved, Sunday morning service is not the is not the field. Come on. Midweek Bible study. As much as we love it, it's not the field. See, Sunday morning worship and midweek Bible study is, is where we come to get equipped on, to do the work of ministry. We leave Sunday morning service. We leave midweek Bible study to enter the field. After we've been equipped, we go to the field where we put into practice what we've been learning in class. You get it? Yeah. See, yeah. it's on the field where the daily decisions of life are being made. It's on the field where we demonstrate what we've learned by putting it into practice. It's on the field where we put into practice what we've learned by teaching others. And it ought to be our desire, beloved, to not be a Monday morning quarterback. You know, after the game is played on Sunday in the NFL, there's always these Monday morning quarterbacks who show up on various television stations pontificating about what should have been done or what needs to be done, but they weren't on the field. They were not on the field. And listen, it's, it's far easier to show up than to get up and get on the field. It's, it's far easy to sit in the stands and in the pews and then come Monday talk about what needs to be done rather than getting on the field. So God, beloved, hasn't saved us to sit on our assets. God has saved us to serve by getting in, getting in the game, getting on the field, and doing the work Amen. of ministry. Amen. Because when we do the work of ministry, we can't do the work of ministry with a bib tied around our neck. Amen. Oh, no. When we do the work of ministry, beloved, we do the work of ministry with an apron tied around our waist as we get on the field to serve our God who has called us and saved us. Mm -hmm. So, beloved, I believe we can all agree in this place today where eternal life exists. There should be spiritual growth. There should be spiritual maturity for the purpose of building the saints up into Christ likeness. And so as we have trekked our way through this particular portion of Ephesians chapter 4, what we have been observing is some, some elements, some key elements, I believe, for body building. If you ever look at uh, professional bodybuilders, just to use them as an illustration, they're always looking for various ways to get stronger, to get bigger. And the reason why they are trying to get stronger most of the time is for selfish reasons. But the reason why we are trying to grow and get bigger or grow deeper in Christ is for selfless reasons. And so as we've been trekking our way through these verses, we have observed one element 
called allocated grace gifts that have been sovereignly given to us by our gods. But we also have seen the need, our need for an ascended Christ. We've noticed that there's also been, that we, we saw the element of the authority of Christ that seemed active through his church. We saw that there was a need for an awareness of the difference between foundational gifts versus functional gifts. And then there was the element of the attainment of unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And then last week we also looked not only at the attainment to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, but we also examined or looked at the element of authentically living as a mature reflection of our head who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so, beloved, as we work our way through these verses that are before us today, uh, the key elements I want us to hang our, our thoughts on or meditate upon are the elements of adolescence and adulthood. <laughs> adolescence and adulthood. And specifically, we need to avoid being adolescents or spiritual adolescents and we need to advance towards spiritual adulthood. Avoid being spiritual adolescents and advance towards spiritual adulthood. And regarding avoiding being spiritual adolescents, look with me at verse 14. Because in Ephesians 4, 14, the word of God says, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves of wind, the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. So beloved, we see some key words there. You know, circle children, circle waves, and circle wind. Because verse 14 gives us the negative aspects of spiritual immaturity. The negative aspects of spiritual immaturity. And we want to avoid spiritual immaturity. And spiritual immaturity, according to Ephesians 4.14, is behaving like children in regards to spiritual matters. Well. And the word children, understand, doesn't just mean physical age, but a childish understanding in that children often lack insight and discernment. So the word picture I pick for children is that of an adolescent because Adolescence is a very critical time of development in the life of a child. Mm -hmm. An adolescent is someone who is in the process of developing from childhood to adulthood. Mm -hmm. And in the process of developing from childhood to adulthood, there is a lot of immaturity going on. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's ever been a parent before, you can testify that there's a lot of immaturity going on. And Paul is saying, we don't want to act like children when it comes to spiritual matters. Because adolescents get easily distracted. Adolescents, children, they, they, they tend to choose things which are not in their best interest. Amen. Yes, adolescents tend to follow all the latest fads. You know, one week they wear polka dot socks, the next week they may be wearing uh, socks with squares on them. It's because it's just the, the latest fad. Adolescents are, they tend to have a hard time displaying delayed gratification. And, you know, they, they always seem to be changing their mind. 
So changing their minds about the style of clothes they want to wear. Changing their minds about the kind of food they want to eat. Changing their minds about the kind of music they want to listen to. Changing their minds about the latest hairstyle that they want to wear. And just like adolescents, when it comes to spiritual matters, we do the same thing. Amen. Tell, tell the truth. Because we, like adolescents, are prone to always be changing our minds. Changing our minds about uh, the authority of Scripture. Changing our minds about uh, the sufficiency of Scripture. We listen to one preacher over here and then we start changing our minds about the, the inspiration of Scripture. Listen to another preacher, then you start changing your mind about the inerrancy of Scripture. Go and listen to one of your friends and you start changing your mind regarding theology proper or the doctrine of God. You go listen to one of your other girlfriends who told you to watch this preacher on the internet and then you start changing your mind about the identity of who Jesus is. Go to work and talk to one of your, your, your colleagues at work and then you start changing your mind about the relevancy of the church and Christianity all together. Well. And so, beloved, we don't want to be spiritual adolescents. We want to be mature. God doesn't want us to be spiritually immature. I believe this is the point that Paul was making when he was writing to the saints at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13 and 11 when he said, when I was a child, when I was a child, I, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Mm -hmm. Yet when I became a man, I put away childish things. So, beloved, we need to understand that God wants us to be growing. And the point of verse 14 in Ephesians 4, 14, it, it, it's, understand, it's really not about a child who speaks inarticulately compared with an adult who can speak articulately. Because remember, the word children in verse 14 can also mean an adult who has a childish understanding when it comes to spiritual matters. Well, you ever met anybody like that before? <laughs> you know, have you ever met anybody like that? Full grown. Full grown adult biologically. But when it comes to the things of God, they have a childish understanding when it comes to spiritual matters. Yeah. Mm. See, it's not about chronological age. Mm. Because you can take some teenagers who are 17 and 18, and you can line them up against somebody who may be 60. Amen. And in some instances, that teenager who is 17 and 18 May be, more, be, may be more spiritually mature than the adult who is 60. Amen. So don't get in the trap of chronological age thinking that just because you've attained this age that you're spiritually mature. That, that's not always the case. And so what we need to know is, is whenever there are spiritual adolescents, they are always be confusing. You know, spiritual adolescents, if you've ever raised kids before, you know, they always got to have it their way. Yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. Yeah. If they don't have it their way, it can't be no way. <laughs> that lets you know a person is spiritually immature. Because you're not going to get everything that you want. Amen. you got to learn how to share sometimes. <laughs> Like I tell my grandchildren, sharing means caring. You know, you can't have all the toys for yourself. You can't have all the goodies for yourself. Sometimes you got to share with your other cousins. 
And we need to learn that as adults. We can't have everything we want in our way. Listen, this is not about us. Sure Christianity is not about us and what we want. It's about what God wants. So whenever that happens, beloved, whenever we see spiritual immaturity taking place in a local congregation, confusion always results. And God is not the author of confusion. Come on, God. And confusion results in the fact that spiritually immature children are not grounded in Scripture like they're supposed to be. Mm. So they get so they get into a point in their life where they're moving from place to place. They're moving from this place to this place. Let me make it plain for you. They move from this church to this church. Because mm -hmm. they're immature. They move from one pastor to this pastor. Because that's what immature, spiritually immature folk do. Yeah. One pastor over here say something they don't like. Oh, they gone. They gone to the next one. <laughs> Until he say something <laughs> that they don't like. Man. And then they go find them a female one. And that's not even a pastor at all, biblically speaking. So they move from one church to the next church, one pastor to the next pastor. And all this movement is symptomatic of spiritual immaturity because they're confused. Beloved, let me tell you something. There's not going to be a pastor or a church in the world that you sit in or under that's going to tell you everything that you want to hear or that you're going to agree with 100% of the time, 100% of the time. Amen. Come on. Because he's not called to agree with you 100% of the time. Amen. He's called to preach the word. Amen. He's called to preach the word in season and out of season. Whether it cuts you or cuts him, it's still got to be preached. Amen. So, Amen. Spiritual immaturity and confusion mm. is also seen in how those who are spiritually adolescent in their understanding of the word of God and applying the word of God to their lives and how they react to those who are trying to turn them away from the faith. Well, mm. I mean, it comes time in our lives where if a Mormon come to your house, you be look, you ready. You know, let, let, you got your Bible up under your arm. You ready. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. As a matter of fact, before you leave, I'm going to tell you to repent and believe in Amen. Jesus. Amen. I mean, it ought to come a time in our lives if a Jehovah Witness come to your door that you look, you got Bible by the door, scriptures ready. You ready to go. Come on. Open up. Now, I don't want your material. This is what I got to tell you. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, there ought, to, there ought to come a time in our lives when you see a prosperity teacher telling you something that where you always got to give to get something from God that you ought to be like, man, what you talking about is crazy. Where do you get that at in Scripture? It takes a lot of hermeneutical gymnastics for you to get to that point where right. God going to give you something if you give something. God don't need anything that we have. So, the threat of those who are always trying to turn us away from the faith was alive and well in the first century, and it's alive and well in the 21st century. Yes. Lest we forget the backdrop to the whole book of Ephesians, it's found in the book of Acts. And when Paul got ready to leave Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he called the Ephesian elders to him and he said, listen, I know I'm getting ready to leave. I'm getting ready to go. I'm getting ready to leave. Start around the 29th verse. He says, but after my departure, after I leave you, there's going to come some wolves, savage wolves wolves who are not going to spare the flock. 
And some of them will come from within your own number. Yeah. Men are going to arise to pervert and twist scripture, to draw disciples away after themselves. Well, Beloved, I want you to know this as your pastor. Anytime a false teacher rises up, they're really trying to draw you to themselves and not to Jesus. Come on, God. They want to draw you to them. It's about their kingdom, not Jesus' kingdom. Yeah. It's about what they are trying to build and not what God is trying to build. God is not trying to build bigger buildings. Yeah. God is in the business of building people. Yeah. And so the threat of false teaching was real in Ephesus. And we need to know that the threat of false teaching is real at Mount Zion as well. Yeah. It's real. And so spiritual adolescents are easily confused by false teachers who basically just want to turn you away from God. Well, and the text uses uh, two words to describe this. It uses the word waves and wind. Waves and wind. Being tossed here and there by the waves. You know, as waves of the sea have the ability to throw a ship off course. So do the waves of false teaching. They have the ability to throw you off course spiritually and have you dazed and confused. And not only this, the waves of the culture. If you are taking your moral cues from the culture, you are going to be thrown off course. It'll keep you thrown off course because we are living in a culture that Shall I say, whereby God has just about disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. We live in a culture that has re embraced religion without God. Mm -hmm. Don't y'all ever forget all that protesting and stuff that y'all was seeing two years ago in, in the city of Louisville? Mm -hmm. There was more religion going on than anything else. People saying mantras, chants, pouring out libations, even praying. I didn't even know what some of them people were talking about. I didn't know what God they were talking about. And so we have religious institutions. We have spare rituals, strange rites that are popular but devoid of the biblical Jesus. Well, That's the culture you live in. Yes, it is. So we have a culture today that has created what I call a design of God. A culture in which the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, said, and I'm quoting, where there is Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. Because y'all do know that when everybody, when any time somebody dies, you know, there's this temptation for folk to want you to preach whoever it is into heaven. Because we've been lured into this mindset in our culture that everybody who dies goes to heaven. And if we are not careful, Talking about the saints, the waves of the culture, the waves of false teaching can throw us into such a state of confusion that we shipwreck our own faith. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And so there's not only the waves, there's the wind. And the wind, if you look closely at the text, the wind specifically speaks to Teaching, teaching, teaching done by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Men who have as their goal to lead the undiscerning astray. So they, they utilize craft. 
craftiness. They, they utilize deceitful schemes to draw you away. Well, and beloved, this is often done from behind pulpits today. Well, mm, mm. And the reason it's done is because in many pulpits across America, you have preachers and pastors who have lost confidence in the word of God. Come on, God. Mm. And because they've lost confidence in the word of God, they will not teach what thus saith the Lord. Mm. Mm. You get more politics and their heart issues, whether they be presidents of certain universities in the city, they talk more about that than they talk about Jesus. Mm. And, that, and the reason that happens is because they've lost confidence in the word of God. Oh my God. And what ultimately happens from behind the pulpit flows into the people. Mm -hmm. And so, beloved, the word picture for trickery in the text is that of loaded dice. Mm -hmm. The wind of the trickery of false teachers is like that of loaded dice. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever been in their BC life and you done played dice games before? And, and, and you know they shake them up. Shake them up, shake them up, shake them. They blow. They blow on them. Back go little Joe. That's the word, bitch. Somebody is in a dice game, in a game where these cubes are being used to play this game, but the undiscerning doesn't realize that they're being fooled. Mm. The undiscerning doesn't realize that a trick is being played. Well. And so the undiscerning, what they end up doing is buying in wholesale to what the person is tricking them in to do. Mm -hmm. They get deceived by the craftiness of Satan, who's the mastermind behind all false teachers. And what it really is, is counterfeit Christianity. It's Christianity with a little Jesus here. It's Christianity with uh, even some liturgy. It's, it's Christianity with even some hymns and some songs. But it's devoid of the word of God. Mm, come on. It's devoid, devoid of believing in the authority and the sufficiency of scripture. And what I'm trying to tell you is spiritual faiths look like the real deal, but they're not. Yeah, come on, dog. Yeah, they're more like Judas Iscariot. Than Jesus. And so they're like magicians who use sleight of hand techniques and sleight of eye techniques that are not readily discernible to the unsuspecting. Mm. So the question for the 21st century church is what are we going to do to recognize fakes? Well, what are we going to do to recognize counterfeits? And I'm going to tell you, we have to become so familiar with the truth of God's word that when a counterfeit comes in, when a, a Jehovah Witness comes to your house or comes up in this church with a new world translation of the Bible, you'll be able to say, that ain't the word of God. You'll be able to recognize a counterfeit so fast because you've been in the Word of God, you've been equipped by the Word of God, you're growing into adulthood that when error creeps on the horizon, you're ready. And so, beloved, we want to avoid being spiritual adolescents because spiritual adolescents get confused. And instead, we want to advance, or in contrast, we want to advance towards spiritual adulthood. Mm -hmm. And spiritual adulthood is ultimately Christ-likeness. Because the goal of bodybuilding is 
Christ likeness. Advancing into spiritual adulthood is not something that is going to happen overnight either. Amen. You don't become spiritually mature overnight. Amen. It takes a lot of practice. Amen. It takes a lot of work. And listen, I'm going out on a limb and I'm here to tell you today that it's going to take all of your natural life to become a spiritually mature adult in the faith. But the one thing that we have to do to continue growing and advancing into spiritual adulthood, spiritual maturity, is we got to be consistent. Amen. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, at the first of the year, every year, you know, every January 1st, everybody make resolutions that they're going to get in shape. <laughs> You know, they're going to lift some weights. <laughs> they're going to walk 30 to 45 minutes a day. You know, they're going to eat right. You know, that, that, that's the goal, right? Amen. But the one thing that's lacking is consistency. Amen. And so by the time we get to, uh, let's say, uh, February 28th, <laughs> the time you get to February 28th, you know, they like, shoot. Man, I ain't thinking about that. Where them hamburgers at? <laughs> Where them ribs at? Amen. And so, beloved, we are going to be growing into spiritual, spiritual adulthood for the rest of our natural lives, but it takes consistency. It takes consistency. Consistently being real in our conduct. And consistently being real in our speech. Come on. Yeah. You know, we're not trying to be fake. That's right. Come on. We're being real in our conduct, real in our speech. That's the reason why, you know, I don't want to put Brother Ray on the spot, but that's the reason why I like Brother Ray, because Brother Ray is real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When he come to me and talk to me, he's real. He's he not trying to put on some fakery. He's real. He'll tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Nah. There's a lot of people that I encounter, you know what, they only telling me good. When I already know that there's some bad and some ugly going on as well. Nah. So, beloved, we need to be able to be transparent enough and mature enough to let everybody know that I haven't arrived yet. Nah. Your pastor has not arrived yet. I am still growing into spiritual adulthood and I preach the word of God every week I'm still growing there's stuff that I'm still learning each and every day of my life about the Lord and, and, and how the Lord is using circumstances in my life to aid in my sanctification to aid in my holiness in order for me to become more Christ like tell the truth God amen so, mm, being real in our conduct and real in our speech. It's kind of what Paul alludes to in verse 15, where he talks about, but speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Mm -hmm. And do you see the craftiness? Uh -oh. that, I mean, do you see not the craftiness, but the contrast between what is said in verse 15 and what is said in verse 14? Mm -hmm. Speaking the truth in love is contrasted with the trickery of men scheming. Mm -hmm. So instead of being crafty, trickery, and trying to scheme on folks, we speak the truth in love because that's one of those verses, verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 4, that is always taken, I believe, taken out of context. There's been very few people that I have heard that actually use speaking the truth in love in its proper context. And so, speaking the truth in love, or shall I say, speaking the truth, it, it cannot be divorced from love. Well. And speaking the truth cannot be divorced from actually living the truth. But the love that, that the Apostle Paul is talking about in verse 15 is the kind of love that considers the interests of others above self. Come on, dog. And so we don't speak the truth to people. 
divorced from love. Because love has a way of massaging the truth. Especially when it's a difficult truth that you got to have with somebody. Amen. Amen. And so what this means is, is we ought not to use the word of God as a weapon against our adversaries. Amen. We ought not to use the word of God as a means of being the heresy police. Mm. You know, every time somebody is saying something, listen, we trying to, we ain't listening to see if we can, can learn something. We listening to see if there's any heresy in what they say. Mm. Our goal, beloved, is to speak the truth, live the truth, and do it in such a way. Well. That it causes growth within the body of Christ. And you know what? You're not going to do it perfectly. Amen. You're not going to speak the truth and live the truth perfectly. But it does aid in the growth of the body. Because verse 15 says again, but speaking the truth in love. We are, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. The goal is for us to grow up in the Christ. Christ who is our, our head. Our head who supplies the church with the resources it needs to accomplish the work of ministry. Yeah. Any ministry that we do, you're not doing it in and of yourself. You're doing it because Christ is the one who is supplying us with what we need. And as we are doing the work of ministry, corporately as the body, we'll find that the body is growing into him who is our head. So again, this is not about quantitative growth. This is qualitative growth. This is not about nickels and noses. This is about people who are collectively and individually growing up into our head who is Christ. Because God, beloved, whether we know it or not, wants us to be maturing spiritually. He wants us all to be growing up spiritually. As he says in his word in 2 Peter 3 and 18, we are told, beloved, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So spiritual growth is about becoming less like ourselves and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. And since Jesus is the object mm -hmm. of our growth, yes, and yes. since Jesus is the standard for our growth, it should be the desire, the thirst of every believer to want to be like Jesus. Oh yes, that, that should be your highest gain, aim and goal. That is to be like Christ in your life. Because understand, the growth into spiritual maturity well. is something that requires activity and not passivity. Amen. It requires activity and not passivity. Growth into spiritual maturity is actively accomplished through our interconnectedness to one another in Christ. Come on, God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because this is what the Apostle Paul is unpacking for us in verse 16, where he uses two metaphors to describe the church. Yeah. The first metaphor that Paul uses in verse 16 is a body. The second metaphor that Paul uses in verse 16 is a building. Mm -hmm. He says being fitted and held together. Well. And the question we must be asking ourselves is how is the body and the building being held together? Mm -hmm. How is the church going to be held together because the text again it says in verse 16 every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part did y'all see that each individual part each individual part what this means is is i got a role to play ray got a role to play sister has got a role to play sister pam got a role to play we all got a role to play. Because the joint 
is not mortar that is put on some bricks oh, to keep the uh, bricks in place in the building. Mm. We are being held together, fitted together, and growing into a holy temple. As Ephesians 2.21 talks about, we're growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So, we have growth in Christ because Christ is the head of the body who is supplying the body with what it needs to grow. And so, there's not a building for Jews. There's not a building for Gentiles. There's not a body for Jews. There's not a body for Gentiles. There's one body. There's one building composed, comprised of both Jews and Gentiles that is being fitted together in Christ. Let me make it plain. There's not a black church. There's not a white church. There's not a brown church. There's just the church that's being fitted together into a holy temple in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not growing independently from one another. We're growing interdependently upon one another. And if we are to grow together, we got to stay connected together. Yes. And we can connect with one another being isolated from one another. My God. That's the reason why I disdain this church from home thing. Because spiritual connectedness doesn't happen when we're in silos. Sitting in front of an iPhone or a television. Spiritual connectedness happens in the context of a local assembly. Word, and so understand the whole body, the entire body functions as a unit. Come on. Don't you know God has not placed you here by accident? Amen. I'm speaking to every one of you all under the sound of my voice here today. And even those who are not here, you just go home and tell them, you know, God didn't place you in Mount Zion as an accident. Amen. He placed you here because God knows there is something that you need to do in this body in order for this church to grow spiritually mature in our head who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are resisting what God is doing, then you're causing the body not to grow. You're causing the body not to function properly. I don't care how old you are, God got work for you to do. Amen. He got some work for you to do. If it's just picking up the phone and calling somebody and saying, hey, baby, haven't seen you. I'm just letting you know I'm praying for you. Listen, that's work to do. Amen. Amen. So each individual part has to do its work in ministry to cause the body of Christ to grow. Mm -hmm. Every Christian has a responsibility to do their best. Amen. Even two people with the same gift will not have the same gift at the same level because we're all growing at different paces. Mm -hmm. But yet each person, even the same people, two people with, with the same gift, they can still do that same gift to the best of their ability to help the body of Christ to grow into maturity. Amen. Because with each person doing its part, with each part of the body doing its part, you know what we're doing? We are body building through and in love. Amen. Because you see that's what Paul says. The growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So the church is not built up by gimmicks. The church is not built up by the latest Christian fads. The church is built up through love. See, if we love the body, it's going to flourish. Yes, if we love the body, it's going to grow. 
And if there is no love within the body of Christ, the body is not going to grow. Wow. The body is not going to flourish. Because we can't body build effectively if we got hate in our heart. Amen. We can't body build effectively if we don't have love in our heart. If we have the fear of change in our hearts. We can't body build effectively with pride in our hearts. We can't body build effectively with arrogance in our hearts. Because hate, fear, pride, and arrogance don't aid us in living like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we want to look like Christ, if we want to live like Christ, we got to be known as people who love like Christ. Christ. And the reason we got to be known as people who love like Christ, because it was Christ himself who said that by this all people will know that you are my disciples. In other words, if folks see us loving one another as the body of Christ, they'll say, listen, those are the disciples of Christ. As a matter of fact, beloved, if I could just make it plain for you as I draw near to my clothes, God is love. And since Jesus is God, then Jesus is love. Uh, if I could even make it more plain to you, I would tell you this, that everything that love is, Jesus is because of who he is. Yes, love is patient because Jesus is patient. Love is kind because Jesus is kind. Love doesn't envy because Jesus doesn't envy. Love doesn't boast because Jesus doesn't boast. Love isn't proud because Jesus isn't proud. Love isn't rude because Jesus isn't rude. Love is not self-seeking because Jesus is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered because Jesus is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs because Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil because Jesus doesn't delight in evil. Love rejoices with the truth because Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Love always protects because Jesus is our protector. Love always trusts because Jesus is worthy to be trusted. Love always hopes because Jesus is our blessed hope. Love always perseveres because Jesus perseveres. Love, all, love never fails because Jesus never fails. I know he hasn't failed because he hasn't failed me yet. As a matter of fact, it was love It was love that was buried in a grave for me. It was love that love that rose from that grave early one Sunday morning. It was love that ascended into heaven. It's love that's preparing a place for me. It's love that's interceding for me. And it's love that's going to come back and receive me into his kingdom. So until love Jesus Returns. Yeah. We have to be about the business Man. of doing the work of ministry mm -hmm. in order to aid in the growth of the body. Amen. As we are doing the work of ministry. In order to aid in the growth of the body, we cannot take credit for any growth that happens. Amen. Don't give me the credit, right. and Amen. don't you take the credit. That's right. But all the credit belongs yeah. to Jesus. Yeah. All the credit belongs to Jesus. All the glory belongs to Jesus. Yes. Uh, one of the psalmists said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, mm -hmm. and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen. So, brother, let's go
all together. Amen. Let's serve together. Mm -hmm. God bless you. And may heaven smile upon you. Perhaps there's somebody here today who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. The Bible just basically says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you want to know more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, come see me at the church. And I'll do my best to explain what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ.